No, I love that downtime. I can smoke and drink coffee. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Collider Ladies Night. I am so excited for this one. I have Tania Miller with me, and we are going to get to talk about The Haunting of Bly Manor, which is hands down one of my most anticipated shows of the entire year, and it met all those expectations and surpassed them. I am mighty obsessed with the show. So, Tania, huge congratulations. Ah, oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so before we even dig into Bly, we got to learn a little bit about you. And one place okay. I usually like to start is what movies and shows were you watching when you were younger? And do you find that any of those movies or shows have influenced the kind of roles that you gravitate towards today? Um, ooh, movies and shows. So... I can tell you my favourite shows when I was a very little girl. I used to, um, I wasn't allowed to watch TV very much when I was little. It was always a bit of a treat. You know, my mum was always like, go read a book or, you know, go play with something. Uh, but my aunt, oh, who lived the other side of London, she had cable. And cable was like, not many people had cable, but she had cable. I was like, ah. So I'd watch all the... Um, like the musicals and the film noirs and my cousins would be outside playing. I was like, no, no, I'm going to watch TV. I'm going to watch all these wonderful programs. But the ones that stuck with me, uh, the classics, were um, The Wizard of Oz, obviously, for obvious reasons, Annie. Um, but my two, and my also favourite has got to be Bugsy Malone. I was like, oh my God, kids are acting. I can do that. I want to be on Bugsy Malone. And fame. Oh shit, now you've got me rolling now. Sorry, am I allowed to swear? Uh. I've got a potty mouth. I do. <laughs> Wait, well, I didn't even hear what you said. I mean, you can pretty much say I, anything. I said, I said the S word. Oh, uh, I've said That's not too words. bad. It's totally fine. <laughs> it happens on this show. Um, so, you, so you knew from a very young age that you wanted to be an actor. I was lucky. I was lucky. Like, I, I have a daughter and I say, what do you, you know, what's the watch? So, darling, so, you know, what, what do you think you want to do? I don't know. You didn't know it at all. God, what, 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 what is this child going to do? You know, and I realized how lucky I was. I mean, from a very, very early age, I'm talking like, you know, teeny me. I knew I wanted to be an actor. And I did want to be a nurse as well at one point. Then I wanted to be a therapist at one point. But I was like, I'll be a nurse and an actor, or I'll be a therapist and an actor. And, you know, um, but the acting stuck. The acting stuck. And the cool thing is, as an actor, you can play a nurse or a therapist in a movie and still exactly. all the boxes. I'm taking all the, I'm going to do all the professions. <laughs> Let's come back to the questions. Like, I don't know if it inspired kind of roles that I play now. Um, I think the beautiful thing about this job that I do is um, you get to just do the most exciting things. Everything's sort of different, you know. I'm, I'm lucky in that respect, I think. Yeah. That's part of the reason why I love being on my end of it, where I can just absorb all the new different things that happen all the time and <laughs> celebrate them. Yeah. So you knew you wanted to be an actor when you were young, but do you remember the moment where it kind of became like a real possible career for you? Because, you know, everyone talks about making it big in Hollywood and it can be a pipe dream. It's a one in a million type of thing. So when did it really click that it's a possibility for you? Um... I don't know if it ever clicked as a bit like Hannah. I, there was a denial that it wouldn't not click. I'm going to do this and um, I'm going to do it and let it be done. And it hasn't been an easy journey. It hasn't like been, you know, it hasn't landed in my lap. It hasn't been handed to me on a plate or anything like that. I've had to graft and, you know, I've had several other jobs to support while raising two kids. I mean, my children were um, under the five when I went to drive school and I was a single parent as well um but I was just like and because I had them young you know like when you're young everything is possible right so I had kids but I'm still a kid myself almost you know so but that dream of everything is possible so I went in with that view so it didn't really click it's just I just started getting paid <laughs> <laughs> that is a key there so you you went to drama school was there ever a point where you were kind of debating should I go to drama school it's like a program that I have to pay for or should I just get out there and get experience um no I sort of went around the traditional route I'd had sort of you know did some short films and I did some theater um pre-drama school but it was always actually uh, there's a story to this so I um auditioned there was a few that 
I knew that my borough that I lived in, I would get sort of like some fundings and a loan, a student loan, but you had to, had to be certain drama school. So I auditioned for a place called Guildford School of Acting. And I just finished, I was with my, my now ex-girlfriend and we, she is a singer songwriter. And we did this club, a, a gig in Soho, and she used to force me to do backing things. Like, I hope I can sing, I don't want to sing, but she would force me up there. <laughs> <laughs> so on this rooftop bar in Soho, in this little club called the Hallian Club, no longer it exists. And you know, there's, those are days where you could smoke indoors, so it's all smoky and we're drinking rums and four hours sleep, if that. I have an audition the next day for drama school. I'm still, a little tipsy you could probably smell it on me right then anyway I go in and I do my pieces uh, and they say can you hold on and I say yeah okay uh, and they make me do it again at, in front of a new new panel these two women and I forget my my Shakespearean piece I forget it and I drive oh can I start again and I said don't worry don't just sit down so I'm sat down and they said we'd like to offer you a, a, a place and I went what are you for real? This doesn't happen. I was really fortunate. I just think I ticked a lot of boxes. But then, um, you know, lesbian, older, single parent, black, all dead. I think I just ticked boxes. So like, yeah, we can we can get all our fun money if we give her a place. So, um, and I, they said, how will you pay for it? I said, I ain't got any money. I'm a single parent. I don't have any money. I would need a scholarship. They said, we'll give you a scholarship. Bam. Like that. Incredible, right? Have you kept in touch with anyone in that program or maybe more specifically anyone that was involved in getting you that scholarship? Do they get to see the stuff you do now? And they're like, see, we knew it. Yeah, um, not so much the, 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 the teachers. There were some beautiful teachers, but it was also very scarring. Drama school was very scarring, actually. Um, now I look back at it. Um, but certainly like my class, some of my classmates from that year, um, we were in the odd group, so it was all like the quirky people were in my group. Um, the dare to be different. Yeah. Um, so I keep in touch with them. But there were some beautiful, beautiful women and men who supported and were amazing at drama school. But then there was a the whole institution behind it. You know, I was the only black person in my year. It says it all. Do you, do you mind if I ask a little more about what, what made it a scarring experience? What Was it a situation where they kind of had like certain expectations and a certain like rigorous program that you had to fit into and, and you and your group of friends did not? Um, yeah, I think it was, it was all of those, all of those things. Um, I think uh, they have, I don't know what it's like in the States, but in this country, they feel like they have to break you down. You know, they have to break you down to build you back up again. Only they break me down and I wasn't built back up again. And, you know, you'd have all these children, I say children, who are 18, 19, they've left home for the first time. They're in floods of tears and like, okay, now you're getting to the rawness and the realness. I'm not crying. I've done had a mortgage, done divorced my husband. I'm now with this beautiful woman, decided I'm not doing men anymore. I have two kids. I go shopping at the supermarket at three o'clock in the morning because it's the only time I can shop. This shit is not going to make me cry. Right? I can do, you know. Um, so there's this wearing, wearing, wearing down of, of spirit and soul. And, um, and, and also the first day, I remember we sat in a circle. There was about 10 of us in our class and uh, the head of music at the time, not that I was on the musical course, but the head of music says, okay, so what's your name? Introduce yourself. What's your name? Why do you want to be here? What makes you, what do you think you'll do in, in the future? And there's five people, and they say their name, uh, five people for me, they say their name, what they want, why they want to be here, what kind of career they want in the future. And he gets to me, and I'm about to say, my name is, and he says, well, you know, there are no good black actors in this country, so we're very fortunate to be here. This is my first 10 minutes in class. And I think that just says it all, right? So you say, what scars me? That says it all. When we did restoration, I'm from East London. This accent's totally affected. I grew up speaking like that, do you know what I mean? That's how I grew up speaking. And I grew up with a lisp as well, which is sort of sometimes creeps in, um, but vigorous voice training. Um, and they assumed that I wasn't getting the text because I had a problem with the, the era, you know, when we were doing restoration, what was politically going on at the time. And I was like, no, it's not that. I mean, yes, it is that because I don't relate to any of these characters that we're looking at or one of these scripts that we're looking at, all these texts and all these playwrights. It's, Totally, there's nothing that represents where I come from or, or my experience. Um, 
but it's not that it's i just literally can't say the words <laughs> yeah, i just can't say it <laughs> after after having gone through all of this in drama school is there anything you can now bring to the sets that you're working on to make sure someone else out there doesn't ever feel this way i'm not sure i mean it's all I can say, I think it's a very individual journey, but I think that you have to just speak up. You just, you just, you really just have to speak up. I had a, an incident recently where somebody we were looking at the American accent and I had a coach and, you know, I was like, I want this rich grounded accent. You know, I want this sort of that African-American sound because I'm, you know, um, and they said, yes, but she's educated. <laughs> what? So if you have an African-American sound, that means you're not educated. So this is the things, and I, I was like, oh, I, I don't want to have to correct you. I, I don't want to do the emotional labor of that. I was having a conversation with my managers and my managers said, well, I'm not too tired. I'm going to deal with it. But normally I would just kind of go, I'd either speak to the person and say why that isn't all right in a really beautiful way, because this person's not malicious. It's just their ignorance, right? But I'm just too old and tired for that now. So I didn't. Um, but I think it's just, just having the confidence to have those conversations. But for the most part, it's, I'm really thankful for this career. It's been a beautiful experience. Yeah. You're, and you're doing, you're doing so, so well too. Before I even jump into the filmography, I do want to add, so whenever I do these ladies night interviews, I literally read everything I can find on the internet and Wikipedia is obviously a big (laughs) source. And one thing that really caught my eye on your page is there's literally a whole paragraph dedicated to you shaving your head. And there are a lot of wonderful quotes in there about just I don't know how that brought more positivity to your life personally and also opened doors for you work-wise when you were deciding whether or not to shave your head, was there, I don't know, like an agent or manager or anybody that you had to convince that this was the right move to make? No, no, I didn't even have proper representation at that time. This was pre-drama school. I didn't have any representation. If you've ever watched Chris Rock's good hair, so I had the, what they call good hair and it was long and you know, I didn't have the kink, kink and I relaxed it and I would swish and I would change my hair. I would spend like an hour, shit man. I would spend an hour doing my hair every morning and then an hour on my face. And I was just hiding behind this, you know, it was a mart, it was a facade, it was a, an, auto, an ego, an alter ego. And I, um, I made a decision very early on that I'm going to, what am I perpetuating here? My mother relaxed my hair, actually. It was my mother because it would take her hours to wash and dry it on a Sunday before school. So she relaxed my hair when I was really young. And I got to my early 20s, like 21, 22 or something like that. and. Um, I decided that I'm going to shave it and grow back in Africa. And then I saw my skull and I fell in love with my skull. I was like, ooh. And now I have hair. I look like a really, I look like a man in drag, but like a really bad drag queen. Not, not, not the good ones, but the really bad ones. That's what I look like with hair. So yeah, I'm just stick with this. <laughs> I highly doubt that, but you rock that look. I, I am Thank all you. for it. <laughs> so I want to start with your, what I believe is your debut role on Dub Play Drama. Do you remember oh, yeah. what it was like stepping onto that set for the first time? And was there anything about that experience that now looking back makes you think, I'm so glad one of my first big gigs was on that project? That's a blast in the past. I, mean, I had this audition in this, it was like a broom cupboard in Brixton. <laughs> and we just sat and we read the lines and, you know, and it was really cool and I sort of understood it. I sort of was, knew that world because I grew up in like one of the roughest parts of East London, but my mother very, very much sheltered, sheltered me from it, but I could see it out there, but I wasn't involved necessarily. So I sort of knew that world, I knew the, the music. Um, and I thought the musicians on that were fantastic. And it was new and exciting, you know, because he had to choose the uh, different endings. And I'd never worked on something like that. But what the, the show I really cut my teeth on was uh, uh, a movie called Stud Life. That was the moment for me that I went, oh, OK. Uh, that was an experience with director and writer Campbell X. It was like the first um, black queer movie that had been made. In, in England, yeah. Oh, wow. I didn't even know that about it. Mm-hmm. Um, so having had some experience on TV, was there anything about being number one on the call sheet for Stud Life that, I don't know, like made you realize something more about leading your own project beyond just doing the performance, but the way that, you know, being number one on the call sheet comes with an ability to kind of set the tone on set? 
I didn't have that confidence at that time. I was just like, I just want to do it right. I just want to do it right. <laughs> so I'm doing the right, am I doing the right thing? And then one, one of my lines. And it was like guerrilla filmmaking. A lot of that, we just got one take and that was it, move on. Um, so it wasn't, there was no time for, for setting the tone. There was no time for conversation. It was do the lines, get into position, do the lines, action, shoot, let go. But what Campbell did is this method acting thing. So for three weeks before we started shooting, we had these rehearsals and he made me dress like a boy. So I strapped down, I wore the baggy clothes. I lived in JJ's world for a little while and um, I had to get my hair cut like a boy. And I, I come back each week with a haircut and he's like, mm -mm, it's still too feminine. Mm -mm, it's still too feminine, so I have the mark up. And I lived in this boy's body and I have to tell you, you know, I had guys hitting on me. I had girls hitting on me. You know, some people thought I was like boy, boy. And some people were like, you know, like cisgendered male. And other people were like, oh, it's a stud. And, oh, I had my pick of everybody. I, I didn't pick because I was in a relationship at the time where I wasn't allowed to pick. But it was, it was a good boost for the ego, I tell you that. <laughs> Did you find that that kind of, you know, possibly one take only experience really prepared you for being in that kind of situation, even on bigger projects, maybe on Bly, where, you know, you guys were pressed for time and you really had to nail something that one time? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's like you, when you've worked on those, when you've come from a theatre background, you've come from, you know, doing the shorts and the guerrilla filmmaking, we haven't got the luxury of budget and time. When you get to something like, lie yeah they're pressed for time but it's like this is a luxury this is an absolute luxury this is cool you know um yeah and, and, and it was there's a lot of there's a lot of downtime as well sometimes you've got to be on 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 and on but there are always turnarounds with the you know when they're turning around and they're setting up lights so you have a breather before you, a little bit of breather before you get onto the next you... scene do you like that downtime or do you find that it kind of like gets you out of your rhythm and you have to figure out ways to stay in it? No, I love that downtime. I can smoke and drink coffee. <laughs> <laughs> like, get all the fags in before they call you. Tania, yes, coming! <laughs> We've got a lot of Years and Years fans over at Collider. Yay! Want to know, is there anything about that series in particular that really stays on your mind? Maybe as far as just how that show kind of dug into, you know, the ways that things were going to change and maybe the things that it predicted accurately versus the things that it didn't? I mean, first of all, it's scary. <laughs> it's scary how, when the COVID thing happened, the first thing I texted Russell, Russell T. Davis was, can you please write something about fairies and fluffy bunnies? Thank you very much, you know? Like, this, it's just, too real it was so close to home it was it was too real um the thing that stuck with me i think is annie Rhee's speech at the end where she says you know it's all it's your fault you're all to blame you all of you when we sat around the dinner table she's you with your one pound t-shirt and some little kids getting half a tuppence for that you know did you complain when the self-checkout service cup no you grumbled and you still used it anyway it's that speech and because it's set in the future, it makes me think that if we do something now, we still may have a chance. We take heed now, we still might have a chance. So that, that really stuck with me. It's scary. I am hugely obsessed with sex education. Oh. And you get one of the coolest cameos because you're in a bunch of like big group scenes. And I don't know if they're like shot from certain angles and you don't get to work with all of the ensemble members, but w what is it like being on that set? Just from my oh, limited my perspective, it feels God. like it's probably the best. It is fantastic. Let me tell you, let me tell you, I turned it down. They asked me to come in three times. I went, mean, no, it's, a ca it's such a small role. And like the series is so good. I don't want to spoil it for myself. I don't want to spoil the illusion. I just want to, I want to watch a second series. I don't want to be in it. I want to watch it and, you know, be drawn into that world. I want to know them. <laughs> and anyway, they said, come down. I said, all right, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. And I'm so glad I said yes. Ben Taylor, producer director, is a genius. Those kids are fantastic. Alistair is Petrie. He's just, what fun to, to work on. What fun to work with. And they're chuckling, you know, they're behind screen chuckling while you, and you can see their shoulders going. 
<laughs> while you're uh, while you're doing the take. <laughs> that's it's actually that's one of my favorite questions to ask about working with particular directors. So I'll pose it to you for all the shows and the films that you've worked on. What director would you say has the biggest reaction behind the monitor that signals to you that they're loving what they're getting? Oh, that's a tough one. Andrew, he directed Witless. You'd see him absolutely giggling. He would call during, during your take, and you're like, okay, we're gonna shoot that again, because you laughed. <laughs> you know, this is a director. Um, Simon Selling Jones is very verbal about what he likes, he does and what he didn't, didn't like, you know. <laughs> Those are the two that, that stick out, stick out for me. Back to sex education. Is there any chance you'll come back for our episode for uh, season three? I don't know. Oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm not. They're already shooting it. They haven't asked me back. Bastards. I'm they joking, I'm joking. <laughs> they added some cool, uh, cool new cast members too. It has me very, very excited. Yeah. Again. Um, I, actually, the fortunate thing about it is I can just enjoy season, season three. I still haven't watched season two yet. I gotta you, let some time pass. So you get the best of both worlds. You get to be in it and now you just get to enjoy it. Exactly, right? Exactly. Now we get to jump into Bly. Let's start with your initial impression of the script and what was it about The Haunting of Bly Manor that made you think this is gonna stand out from any ghost story I've seen before? It was watching Hill House, actually. So the sides came through and I went, mm, okay. They're like, sent me, sorry, Mike, sorry. Um, <laughs> if you see this, sorry. Um, oh yeah, so I was, <laughs> I got sent the slides, like, oh, all right, okay, well, I, I guess I better watch the first season. I hadn't heard of it before. I watched episode one, thinking I would go and learn my lines, and then I would tape. And then I, um, oh, I, uh, I, I binge watched it, I mean, to episode five. Half 11 at night, I was like, okay, I've got to learn some lines. So as soon as I learned the lines and put it on tape, I binge watched the rest. What was it like the first time you were on set with Oliver and Victoria in particular? Was it kind of like a starstruck moment, having just fallen in love with the previous season? Um, not so much starstruck, but just lots of love, you know? Uh, Victoria's just like, she's just the sweetest, absolutely sweetest. Oliver's really funny. We had banter in the first three minutes of meeting. I didn't even recognize him. I was like, so who did you pay? He's like, oh, shit, you were really good, Brie. Um, yeah. But so we had lots of bands, and, and, and Carla was just, the old, the, the original cast were just really welcoming to us newbies. Um, but it was also very fresh. It's a completely new story. I was a big Hill House fan, and I remember going into Bly being, you know, a little worried. I had fallen in love with that family, and I'm like, I want more of them. And then yeah. I start Bly, and I'm like, huh. I don't. And then all of a sudden, something just clicks. I'm like, oh, mm. they, did it. they did it again. Now I'm obsessed with, <laughs> with all, with all the, uh, the people of Bly, too. Yay! <laughs> so, yeah. I don't, I don't know if you're going to want to get into spoilers on this, but we can move it to the other part of the conversation if you do. So feel free to take it whatever way you like. And if there's even okay. an answer to this, but I know in Hill House that that show was just packed with Easter eggs and little details. And yeah, for Hannah, right. her, her earrings, it may seem like a little detail, but her earrings make a huge statement. And I was wondering if there is any specific planning as far as what earring she's wearing and when. <laughs> Yeah, no, actually it was. Actually, um, it's amazing that you picked up on that. I was trying to decipher it myself, but I, I couldn't quite figure it out. The bolder, the bigger, the edgier she's, it's pre, it's past, right? And, the, and they're more subdued and um, conservative. It's present when she's sort of, her armor's on more and she's in her body, she's in herself. Um, but Lynn Falconer, our costume designer, was amazing i don't know what you thought about the costumes i thought i thought they were super fly i thought the drip was like everything um she was great because you know someone was saying the 80s isn't necessarily renowned for its its fashion sense but i think lynn did a, a fantastic job and yeah every detail every detail and as you can see i i love a big yeah. earring i'm a fan of big earring <laughs> <laughs> you wear them well with all of that did you did you get the chance to keep anything from set no that's, sadly, I, sadly, that it's the first job which I haven't done that. Oh no, I'm lying. I'm lying. I kept a couple of hair earrings. <laughs> <laughs> I I was hoping that would be the answer. You should have. Yeah, yeah. I might I might auction them for charity or something like that. You know. Oh yeah. Nice. 
I like, no. I might be first in line at the auction. <laughs> to to there. Um, I'm going to do it now. I'm going to go into some spoilers. Okay. We'll work good, our good. way through certain, certain details and episodes. So for everybody out there who has not seen The Haunting of Bly Manor, please, I hope you can already pick it up in my conversation. You're like, you need to see this show. It's on Netflix right now. Watch it. You're probably going to have to binge it. And you just pause this video and come back after you finished it all. All right. Okay. Yes, a spoiler alert. <laughs> yes, a big one. First thing I want to know is when did you find out the state that Hannah was in in the show? Because I, you, you even mentioned earlier you get sides. Do you know when you're going through the audition process or is it a situation where you're experiencing that as you read the scripts like we do as the audience? Well, almost, yes. I mean, like, I got the sides and then I got the job. I was like, oh, okay. And, you know, so that was cool. Hill House was cool. But I thought perhaps it's just like, um, you know, a small or minor role, right? I know, but I like it. I like Hill House. I want to be part of the project. So anyway, I'm reading episode one and Lynn calls me, the costume designer. And Mike calls me, have you read episode five yet? No, 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 because I shoot in second education. Um, and then I got to episode five. I was like, oh! Shit, I'm a ghost. <laughs> I hadn't put it together. And how do I play a ghost? How do I play a ghost who doesn't know that they're a ghost? Does that mean I just play it as a normal person? Like, why? What do I do? Um, so yeah, I, I, it, that happened for me. But I did know before we started to to film. But I wasn't sure how much to give away when she sort of divers away into memory. She sort of, you know, she's lost and she's like, mm, and she comes back. I didn't know how much to, it was a careful balance in those episodes one to four um, to, to work out what I was going to do. I'm yeah. kind of glad that you got to experience that reveal yourself in a way, even being part of the, the whole making of it. Yeah, I mean, it paid off. I was like, shut the front door. You know, it was such a rewarding moment as well. It's like, oh, I've never played a ghost before. <laughs> before we even get to episode five, two other questions. First, mm. I know this is probably largely on Emily and Benjamin, but I was wondering just from your perspective, watching them, it, is it a situation where you need to know what role they're playing at every single moment also? Or who, yeah. who's kind of guiding them? Yeah, yeah. Um, as the actor, yes. It's really, yeah. And, and um, Ben and um, who plays Miles and uh, Oliver who plays Quint, they would rehearse outside of, um, together, outside of, you know, our allotted time. Ben, those kids, as you know, I worked with children before, as you know, those children are the most professional, beautiful, sweet kids I've ever had the pleasure of knowing, and I am far better behaved than my children ever were. Um, they're just so well behaved and, and intelligent and kind. They're really sweet, beautiful children. You would never know that from Ben's performance, but they're absolutely amazing. They do a full day on set. We get to have our breaks and where I have my bags and my coffee. They're going to go to school. They're going to do five minutes, ten minutes of school. I'm like, it's not fair. Let them alone. Leave them alone. It's not fair. And sometimes I would go into the lessons and say, like, okay, we're going to play a game. That's also, you know, part of schooling, right? <laughs> they are. They are so incredible in this. I see, I really, like, I couldn't get over their performance when I thought that they were just playing kids. But then when I realized what was happening, it's just, that's next level stuff. And they were doing one scene and um, I was looking at little Amelie going, it's your life, darling, you know, as you were filming, because you don't want to call cut, like, like, give her the eye, it's your life. And then she sort of whispered to me, my line's like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> so she said, oh, damn, this kid's showing me up. I better come back prepared. <laughs> that was early on. They were on it. They didn't they knew their lines, they knew everybody else's lines, they knew the stage directions. I'm like, how is this possible? They were just oh incredible. Episode three. Do you know what Hannah whispers to Owen at the end of the episode? <gasps> oh, I can't remember. When he's going into the car. Right after he gets the news about his mother. Yeah. I can't, rem I can't remember. I'm so sorry. I can't remember. Okay. Something, I made it up. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't scripted or anything like that. I think it was something like, I'm here. Oh, I've got you. Or there's no, maybe, I don't know. Something, it was something consoling about having fear and sort of indicating that she loved him and she would hold him and she was here, but without saying that because it's Hannah after all. Yeah. 
That makes sense. Sorry. No, no, <laughs> don't don't be. As long as he gets the point across, and that's that's exactly how I read it. Okay, right. good. <laughs> episode five. Where to eat five. Five. Oh. What what questions did you initially have as far as like the slipping works and how how did they explain the rules of that kind of I mean I don't want to call it like a power, but the way that that works within this world. The the memory jump, so they're going back into to slipping into different memories. I it was it was a complete head, you know, like it blew my mind and I sat down with, with Liam and we sort of we had to work it out. We had he had, we had a very clear storyboard and we went through it and we're like, Okay, so this you just had to know which year you were in and what was going on for you at that time and then just play each of those memories truthfully to that. So that memory and then in the in-between jump so you'd be you know because obviously you don't shoot in order so you'd be shooting something like oh so where are we picking up from so there was a lot of playbacks okay what did i do last time where are we it was very confusing which is great because Hannah was very confused so you know <laughs> i was just genuinely confused a lot of the time and then you get more and more clarity as she goes along yeah exactly yeah you think that she has experienced this memory jumping like that before or was there anything that was said at the bonfire by owen that kind of i don't know puts her on this more intense journey of memory slipping i think the longer that she's dead um the more intense it the, the harder it is to deny her actual reality um, and I think that's what happens at the bonfire, you know, because it'll be the last memory jump is that her going back to the bonfire where Owen's about to go off. That's just literally happened 10 minutes ago, but she's, you know, we've had a whole episode of her being elsewhere and she's too late to say to him, I'll go to Paris with you. I love you. Let's make it work. By 10 minutes where she's previously, she's jumping back years, right? She's going back to 80, gosh, we're in 1987, 1980. Uh, I can't forget the year. How many times she says it? Yeah, Hannah Grace, 1987. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> the conversation that Hannah has right before Peter is killed, did they explain to you how Hannah slips into something that she hadn't experienced before? Yeah, no, they didn't explain it. I mean, well, maybe somebody did, but I can't remember how I got there. <laughs> how I ended up because she says, Miss Jessel says, "What are you doing?" And hold on, I know it's in you here, but why are you, why are you here? Because she's slipping deeper and deeper, right? Because um, something is wrong with Miles. It happens when Owen says something is wrong with Miles, right? And it's a denial. Everything is about denial on the show. Um, that something is wrong with Miles, and you know, so she then slips in, into his memory. It's weird. Like there's these two different realms that exist at the same time with these this ghost world and what, what's real and what, and they slip into each other. Like the rules of some ghosts can touch, some ghosts can't, some ghosts can face, some face away. It's uh, it's pretty complex. I mean, it's it's complex, but if that was our reality, even our very realistic, like, human reality and how we process things right now, I mean, isn't it all super complex anyway? So I feel like it reflects absolutely. our reality kind of well. Yeah, no, absolutely, because life is that complex, you know, and um, boy, all we have is now, I guess. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's what the show is about fundamentally, like, what it is to love and to loss, if it can be seen as a loss if you've loved, you know, um, and how fear gets in the way and how they're all running away from, from a past, running away from something, only to run towards to exactly the same thing they're running away from, you know, as opposed to being still and, yeah. It's a big exactly. part of the reason why the show is stuck on my mind. <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, it's, it's weirdly sort of, really relatable, although it's a horror gothic genre, uh, it's really relatable to what's going on right now, I think. Yeah, I, I find yeah. I keep reading into everything that I watch that way right now. I feel, yeah. I feel like that also speaks to the value of entertainment, period, sometimes, even yeah, though these true. stories are yeah. not true, sometimes they can help us understand something that we might not have been able to process otherwise. Yeah, this is true. I mean, that's what drama and that's what TV and entertainment should do at, at its best, right? It's, it's yes. a fundamental reason for having us, having it. 
I have one more episode five question for you. Okay. For, right. for you as a performer, what was the driving force behind that guttural scream in episode five? Because they're, they're talking about Sam. She's also having this slipping incident right now. So is that the original memory that we experience or has it yeah. morphed? No, that's the original, that's the original memory. Um, oh yeah, that's her original. She goes back into it and then she's back into the, back into the, that memory. Um, and that was her husband leaving her and her no, no longer being able to hold it together. But I think it's also, when you say morphed, yes, I think it's also the pain of the current situation with the frustration of not being able to live her authentic self, not being able to share that love with Owen, not being frustrated with her, with herself, but, you know, wanting to experience love and to be held and to go away to Paris, but just stopping herself and that rebellious, almost, yeah, guttural scream of where there's nothing left, where she has to let it out somehow. Yeah, I've watched the episode a couple of times, and that moment hurts every single time. Oh, as intended, as intended. It plays. Yeah. <laughs> All right, before I let you go here, we always end Ladies' Night with a couple of rapid fire questions. Get to know okay. you stuff. So first, do you collect yes. anything? Uh, shoes, clothes, earrings, jewelry, and more clothes and jewelry, and wool lately since COVID. Oh, wait, did you say wool? Yeah, yarn. Oh, okay. So that's, that's, been, that's been like your, your lockdown activity. That's been my lockdown activity. And eating. <laughs> I think everyone shares that same activity. What What is, what's like your biggest lockdown food-related vice? Like what's the thing that you can't stop yourself from grabbing out of the, the fridge or the cupboard or something? Cheese. Mm. Cheese and wine. And when I was in Los Angeles, don't tell anybody this, Cheetos. There's I got addicted. with Cheetos. <laughs> oh no, the, all the additives, and sorry Cheetos, well. but it's true. But oh God, they're so good. I know, you gotta treat yourself sometimes. Yeah. I actually think I know the answer to this, but that's why I have mm -hmm. to ask it. Do you have any pets? Yes, I have a new puppy, he's four months old. My kids are grown up, I decided to get a puppy. I don't know what's wrong with me, but I'm totally in love with him. He's a gorgeous little Pomeranian who will be coming to, uh, coming to work with me on set and what have you, so yeah. He's, he's a dog. When we, when we start to do in-person junkets again, I hope you bring the yeah. puppy junkets too. Oh my God, I appreciate it. Yes, oh, I'd love to bring him. <laughs> he was on a, I did a photo shoot yesterday and he, um, like he's pretty, well, potty trained. But he forgot all of his training at this photo shoot. I swear to God, he pissed and shat everywhere. Fortunately, the photographer, Joseph Sinclair, check out his work, um, is, uh, he has, also has a dog. And he was like, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Stewie, his dog, used to do exactly the same thing. Don't worry about it, love. You know, but I spent most of the photo shoot, me and my daughter, cleaning up um, his mess. He'll get there. He's only a baby. He'll get there. I'm also sure it was worth it to have his presence there. Yeah, yeah. He got in some of the shots, but, you know. Well, I can't wait to see that. If you could learn more about one job on a film set, what would you choose and why? I think, uh, like, the art department. Is that what you mean by that? Is that yeah, what you yeah. mean by that question? Yeah, yeah, the art department. I think you get to learn a lot about history. You get to make something, create all these beautiful interiors and exteriors. Um, yeah, the art department, I think. I also love costume as well, but, um, and getting to set build, those, those sorts of things, I think. I, I, I love a bit of woodwork. I did a course, plumbing and car carpentry and bricklaying um, at one point, you know, to get a trade in as well. And uh, um, I'm fascinated by the wealth of knowledge that these people have and to create all these different, yeah, all these different times. All right, last one. I feel it's a serious one, and I feel like I've grown into the habit of ending on this because I love okay. it. What is the biggest fear you've had that you actually managed to overcome? Oh, that's a deep one. Um, fear of the scariest job. My biggest fear is um, not living up to not living up to what it, I expect of myself as a parent, as a mother. 
um, and my children's safety and their health. And I went for a time where my son had really ill mental health and it was really, really scary. And like Hannah, which is that guttural scream, that was, I remember feeling like that, but I had to hold it together because if I let go, then I would let all the balls go because it was just me on my own. And so my biggest fear was not holding it together for my kids, but I held it together. I learned to cry and I did have that guttural scream and I learned to be present and they're doing really well. And you know, the, the, they're mentally and physically healthy. So that was the biggest fear an actual episode that I was able to overcome. That was, yeah, well, there you were. We, we were together, you know, as family. I really do feel like sharing stuff like that could inspire someone else out there who might be needing it. So I appreciate you sharing yeah. here today. Oh. I appreciate all thank of your time. You. Seriously, thank you thank so you. much to be able to revisit all the stuff you worked on and in particular to dig into Bly. I mean, ah, uh, you, you guys should be so proud. I'm so excited about the show. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, we're really excited to really... I'm really happy with it. I think Mike and Trevor and all the writers and you know everyone. I think well, they the team. It was a real team effort. And we did it. They did good. They did good. They done good. They did good.